So there are a few things that for me, I had to learn the hard way when it comes to low heart rate training. Really start to understand about myself when it comes to getting into the right zone for low heart rate training, finding the right effort, the right level of, well, pace as well, which we'll talk about, to make sure that I got the benefits that I was hoping for. Low heart rate training can be really frustrating for a lot of people. Um, and I, I want to kind of break a few of those frustrations and set you off down the right path rather than set you up for frustration. And ultimately where so many people end up, they get annoyed, they don't see the progress, they give up. So let's not do that. Let's instead talk about what I've learned and how you can effectively apply this to your training. So the first thing that I really want to talk about is your mindset. I know this sounds really cliched, etc., but it's super important because low heart rate training, running slow to run fast, it looks great on paper, right? It looks really good that you can ease back, do lots of easy running, not stress too much, keep it really relaxed, and all of a sudden on race day, the pace is gonna be there. That's great, but in reality, you've got expectations of yourself. You've got, obviously, memories of being able to push faster or push harder, run faster and running fast up until the point where obviously you know, you've been running fast for a long time and it starts to hurt. But running fast in general feels good. It feels athletic. We feel good about ourselves while we're running fast. All of a sudden, doing mile after mile of running slowly, it can get, it can get to you. It can grind on you a little bit. And allowing yourself, having a word with yourself, allowing yourself to say, right, I'm in this training block now where I'm running slowly. The, the Strava data isn't going to be looking very impressive. Okay, some people even come off Strava and just, I, I think that's, I've been down that route and that's not where I am now, but I think that's a bit extreme. But if it's what's good for you, then do so. But allow yourself to say, right, I am going to slow it down. The runs aren't going to be overly, let's say overly impressive looking, but I have got my own process that I'm working through that other people who might be looking at my data, other people who I might be passing when I'm running, they're not working through that process. Yeah, they're, they're doing something different. I'm not comparing myself to my previous self. I'm not comparing myself to other people. I am working through a process that I'm committing to, and that involves slowing right down. Now, having that word with yourself and committing to that is really, really powerful because it allows you to, firstly, start to just focus on what matters, which ultimately is time spent training in the right training zone. And as you're focusing on what matters, you can start decoupling pace and speed from distance and time. What do I mean by that? Well, there was a great comment actually. Let me throw this up just quickly. See if I can find it. Right, great comment in here from Cass who, who commented on a video a couple of weeks ago. He said, your heart rate doesn't know how far, your heart rather, doesn't know how far it ran, <laughs> but it will know how long it ran for. We don't work out, uh, work our heart rate out by beats per meter. And that, there's a lot to be said for that because when you're doing a, let's say a one hour easy pace run focused on heart rate, don't worry about how far you cover in that hour. In that hour okay, maybe you're used to running, you know, six miles, let's say you're running to running 10K in that hour, but actually when you're running at this kind of lower intensity, you're running at this easier pace, rather than running six miles, you might find you're running five and a half miles, five miles, you've slowed the pace right down. Your brain obviously understands that pacing wise, you've slowed down and you covered less distance, fine, that's one thing, but your heart still knows that you've exercised for 60 minutes. And that's the most important part of this. I say your heart, I mean kind of heart and cardiovascular system. You've exercised for 60 minutes. Now, that adds up. If we're doing 60 minutes of exercise at that correct heart rate on, on Monday, and then perhaps on Wednesday, we're out doing an hour and a half, and then on Sunday, we're out doing another 60 minutes, and you know, we've got various other sessions, whether it's running or even on the bike, those things, all add up and it doesn't matter at this point if you're in this phase of running running slow to run faster running with a low heart rate then just being consistent and running with that nice easy low heart rate 
will start to get you to a point where you see those aerobic adaptations begin to take place. And don't be fooled, it's not going to be something which is going to improve in one, two weeks. But it is something which, over time, can begin to move the needle relatively quickly. If we come back a little bit, this is something from earlier on this, uh, this well, in fact, it was only a couple of months ago. It was a retest from a run that I did back in the, on the 2nd of September. And you can, you can take a look on my Strava if you want to see the actual details here. But this 25-minute run, okay, the first time I did it back in the 2nd of September, which was seven weeks prior to the data here, I did it, again, trying to keep the effort, slow, uh, the effort low, keep the pace nice and slow. I ran at an average heart rate of 100 there we go, 138 beats per minute. Whereas further down the line, as I got to, um, where was this? So seven weeks later, October the 27th, I ran with an average heart rate, heart rate of 131 beats per minute. So actually seven beats per minute lower, yet in that retest, I was running at 45 seconds per kilometer. So that's one minute 12 per mile faster. Okay, so seven weeks, was enough for me to actually see that progression. So I say it takes a bit of time, okay? And usually I say to people, you know, you're looking eight to 12 weeks before you see progress. But if you're diligent about it, you can start to see progress a little quicker. But like I said, don't be fooled. First couple of weeks, you're gonna be out there thinking, this is really frustrating. This is slow, slow, slow. And I think someone mentioned it earlier. I can't remember exactly who it was. Marian, I think, said about, the fact that as soon as she starts even walking, sorry, as soon as she starts even jogging, her heart rate starts to spike a little bit. And by the way, I'd love to know, how long have you been running? Just uh, the question on this slide, just drop it down in the, in the comments there. That's something I see a whole load. People, as soon as they, they get into this run slow to run faster, low heart rate training uh, regime, but as soon as they get into any kind of jog, it starts to pop straight up. That's where run walk is a really great place to start. And quite frankly, even walking is a great place to start. The key here is aerobic exercise. Okay, aerobic exercise, whether it's walking, whether it's run walk, even whether it's cycling, swimming, keeping yourself in that zone for a prolonged period of time is what's gonna train your cardiovascular system, get your heart and lungs working to improve your aerobic capacity. Now, in terms of specificity, specificity, um, when we're talking about, let's say, you've got a marathon to train for, that is something we can look at further down the line. Okay, if you've got a marathon to train for, you can't do it all on the bike. Okay, you need to do some running, you need to get the miles and the legs, you need to build the strength that comes with running. But, especially if you're injury prone, especially if you're new to running, or if you've been off running for a long time, and again, if you look back at my Strava, you can see back in September, I was doing a lot of cycling alongside the run walk sessions that I was doing because it was a way of me getting more cardio, more aerobic work, more zone two work in the week without going and running every day. So Marion, to, to answer your question from earlier, you know, start out with sessions like run for a minute, walk for a minute. And you can see, again, I keep on saying, look at my Strava, but go and look at my Strava. You can see back in September, that's where I started. Run for a minute, walk for a minute. My brain thought, I can go run for an hour. That's not a problem. But I know what would have happened if I'd run for an hour. It would have started out under control, and then we would have seen quite a lot of cardiac drift, which we'll talk about later, um, as I lost control of my heart rate. Um, so there's no point. there was no point in me trying to push too much too soon or trying to kind of give in to what my ego wanted to do. But starting with that run, run walk process, building that up to two minutes, three minutes, four minutes with breaks, that allowed me to then get to a point where, okay, 20 minute run, my heart rate is fairly stable at this point, then I can start to build upon that. I hope, that's, um, I hope that makes sense. But like I said, just getting back to the start of, of the point really I was making is that you your, your brain knows pace, your brain understands speed, but your heart, your cardiovascular system, doesn't understand distance, doesn't understand speed, doesn't understand pace. It only knows that I've been working out at the right intensity for, let's say, an hour. It understands effectively time, if you want to look at it like that. Okay, so moving on from the, the kind of the mental approach side of things, I want to take a look 
at some more kind of real specifics here. So again, the, the title of this whole video is The Secret to Running with a Low Heart Rate. The first part of that secret was to get your head straight and to get your expectations in order and to really you know, kind of buy into the process and to forget pace. Just put that on one side, focus on time. But now we're getting a bit tactical and thinking, well, okay, if I'm at a point where I am going out and running easy for an hour, what can I do to help myself not suddenly see that phew, my heart rate's gonna spike and I've kind of blown it after 20 minutes and you spend the next 40 minutes trying to get control of your heart rate? Well, that's where being a little bit more strategic and a little bit more smart about it really comes in. So if we think about what the kind of the typical situations are where we start to see that, that spike in terms of heart rate. Usually, it's to do with the terrain, okay? It may be to do with perhaps you kind of forget yourself or you get into a conversation with someone that you're running with or you, perhaps a song, if you're listening to music, a song comes on that kind of amps you up a little bit and we start to run away with ourselves. That happens, but more often, it's the fact that you're met with this kind of long, dragging hill and you start to see the heart rate climb and climb and climb and you kind of get to a point where you think, damn, I've, um, I've blown it here. My heart rate's 10 beats higher than it should be. I'm gonna to have to spend the next however long trying to get that back under control. Don't be afraid to walk the hills. Okay, ultra runners do this all the time. Okay, if you've got you know, 100 miles, 100K, 100 miles, whatever, to run, it's so important that you're, you're keeping that effort under control. And the expenditure of effort under control and a good power walk up a hill is going to work that heart and lungs just as hard as you running slowly up that hill and in fact it might do you a great deal of good in terms of being able to be able to just break the pattern up a little bit we've all been on those long runs where the legs start to get a little bit tired they start to get a little bit achy in various places for me a lot of the time it's kind of in the groin region or up in the hip flexor region Starting to really break up the pattern by saying, right, I'm just gonna power walk up the hills. You, you won't, <laughs> you'll barely lose anything in terms of the heart rate. It'll allow you just to stay in the right zone rather than popping out of the, the, the zone two that we're looking to, that aerobic zone we're looking to stay in. But you won't lose out by dropping too far down. You're not suddenly gonna drop out the bottom of zone two. In fact, if you feel you're getting in that direction, just walk a little bit with a little bit more intent. And then if you feel like, okay, I could break back into a light jog, do so. But remember, it's not a sin to walk. Even if you're not on a one even even if you're not on a run walk program, it's not a sin to walk. We're literally just making sure the heart and lungs get the allotted time doing what they're meant to be doing at the intensity they're meant to be working at. That's literally the, the kind of the bottom line to this for most of us. That's what matters the most. Um, all right, Marion actually says that she will stick with the walking and jogging, that's awesome. If you Google um, my name and then run walk program, then there's a free run walk program on, on my website. That, that, um, that's the first eight weeks of that, what I, what I followed as I was getting back into running this time. Um, Martin says, do I exclusively train in zone two? So no is the answer to that. Um, and I think as we get into kind of the, the more meat and meat and potatoes of my marathon training, as we get into the summer, uh, into the spring, you're going to see this. Um, I think of it more as a kind of a polarized training plan. Okay, so running easy, probably 80% of the time, um, and then when it's time to run hard, really running hard and getting particularly a bit more of a focus on the neuromuscular side. I'm not even, I'm not even too fast in this first marathon block before my sub three attempt, which will be later on in 2023. Uh, but in this first block, I'm not too worried about doing specific speed work. I want to focus on just making sure that I'm, I'm not losing the ability to turn my legs over faster. I'm, I'm teaching my legs how to turn over on a quicker, uh, at a quicker pace once I'm under fatigue, and that is more about the neuromuscular system than it is about pushing your lactate threshold. Anyway, we'll talk about that on, a, on another stream if that's, uh, if that's okay. Um, right, uh, Heart of, Hearts of Goldenrod says, is there a chart with all the zones? Yeah, again, there's, there's plenty on there. If, I know it's um, not a helpful answer, but there's plenty on Google. Um, if not, then, well, no, I mean, there is, but I will 
by all means DM me on Instagram and I'll, I'll send you some stuff across. Um, right, so let's get back into it. So preventing heart rate spikes. Yeah, so walking up hills, absolutely massive. That's probably the biggest one. Um, and then as we, as we think about the other ones, really it's pacing. Okay, if you suddenly let your mind wander and your pace shoots up, then that's where we're going to see a spike in terms of your heart rate. And trying to avoid that is super important because you can spend the next, next 10, 15, 20 minutes of a run trying to get your heart rate back under control. And for a lot of us, once we've lost control of our heart rate, it's actually really hard to get back under control full stop. That might be you kind of in the wrong zone for the rest of the run. So really be diligent about trying to stay in the right place. Which leads me into actually the next the next kind of stage of this. Okay, so once we're once we're used to doing lots of walking power, walking up the hills, and and getting very specific about um, about trying to stay obviously at the right pace, we know that on race day we're going to find that there are. Um, there are points where we push, and obviously we're not going to be in our aerobic zone on race day, we're going to be pushing a little bit harder, but the mindset is still the same. But there are points where you're suddenly going to feel like, oh my God, I've gone a little bit too hard here. Okay, Now, you can teach yourself mentally to recover on the run. Now, what I'm talking about in the context of doing this during a, a low heart rate training block is to move away from the place where you're beginning with run walk. And you're saying, right, I'm going to run for a set period, then I'm going to walk, allow my heart rate to, to calm down a little bit, then I'm going to run for another set period, then I'm going to walk, blah, 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 blah. Instead, the progression from that is that you're going to run at the intended pace. And if you feel yourself beginning to go up a little bit of a, a, a steady incline, or you feel yourself perhaps having pushed the pace a little bit too hard and you're beginning to feel your heart rate or see on your watch your heart rate start to creep. It's moving away from the need to then walk. If you can instead really try and ease back on the pace consciously, ease back on the breathing consciously, and this is the kind of the crux to this, and I think Pavel said this earlier on, that the breathing will allow you to get this right. Okay, if you feel like you're pushing that little bit too hard, slow the breathing rate. Okay, go to something like kind of three, three breathing, four, four breathing, three, four breathing. And what I mean by that is we're talking about the number of paces you're taking inhaling, the number of paces you're taking exhaling. If you can run taking four paces for every inhale, four paces for every exhale, then you are doing a great job of slowing it down getting your heart rate back under control. If, you're, if you can move to 4-4 four, four pacing, 4-4 four, four breathing, and your pace then adjusting to that, you'll see after a few minutes, your heart rate will start to calm. Because what probably happened is you, again, if we think breathing rate-wise, whether you were met with that hill or whether you were pushing that little bit harder pace-wise, you probably actually focused, um, sorry, you probably actually moved to a point where you were sort of 3-2 breathing. Okay, so you're in a place where your breathing rate got a little bit quicker because it had to keep up with the pace you were running. So flipping that on its head, slowing the breathing down consciously will allow you to see that recovery. And once you get into that point or into that place where you can recover on the run, you can not just see a run as being a gradual increase, 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 increase in your heart rate along, let's say, a two-hour run. Again, I've got the graph, there we go. You can see the increase there. If we can move away from that cardiac drift, um, or at least calm it down, by being consciously in control of your, of your breathing, uh, and, therefore heart, and therefore effort, and therefore heart rate, then you're gonna find that you're able to sustain much longer, easy runs. Okay, obviously, there's the strength, endurance in your legs, et cetera, et cetera, and the, the natural progression we want to see in terms of your, your long runs, but you'll find that you're able to do your long runs in the right zone for longer. I hope that, that kind of makes sense. Right, let's, before we move on, let's quickly jump into the, uh, into the comments again. So again, Donia says that people walk by you whilst you're running in a low heart rate. Rewinding back to the first point I was making, it's just getting comfortable, getting comfortable with the fact that you are on a different program 
to other people, you're doing something different entirely to what other runners would be doing, you are on your own journey. And just, I guess, kind of parking the, I wouldn't, yeah, I guess kind of parking the ego or parking the expectation of yourself. So don't worry, that's absolutely where you'll be. You know, people at the moment will be walking past you while you're running easy. Let's fast forward eight weeks, 12 weeks. You're going, if you get this right, to be running faster at the same heart rate than you are now. And you will be, again, overtaking people as you're running easy rather than the other way around. Um, again, Ralph talks about uh, coffee affecting heart rate. Yes, absolutely. We'll talk about that as we go. Um, let's have a look further back up here. Tim is, uh, sorry, no, Mark is here from the email. Love to know who else has made it from the email that I've sent out. Um, Timothy Aropa talks about caffeine having an effect. Yep, it definitely, definitely does. We'll talk about that as we uh, as we move on a second. Um, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, what is Justin saying? Uh, as soon as you run any pace faster than 6 to 6 minutes 30 per kilometer, you fall out of zone 2. Whether you're running 5.30 or 4, your heart rate just goes straight to max. But when you walk, it's under zone 2. What to do? Again, Justin, that's where I think jumping into that run-walk kind of pattern would be really, really helpful to start with. There's nothing wrong with walking. Okay, as I said right up front with this, your heart just needs to know that it's operating in the right zone for the right period of time and that's literally all that matters okay whether you're walking whether you're running whether you're cycling swimming whatever it's all about just keeping your cardiovascular system operating at the right level of intensity for the given period of time okay and over time you can increase that period of time per week that you're working at um, and just like i said decouple the whole idea of of pace and speed um, it's just not or and even distance it's just not important okay will be as you get into the training for specific events but if we're simply talking about improving your aerobic fitness which is what running with a low heart rate is all about um and the kind of the, the run slow to run faster method if you like or philosophy is all about then time time is the thing okay right we'll get back to the comments in a moment um, but yeah recovery on the run super super important just learning to ease back and see that you can drop your heart rate without having to slow and walk that might take you a few months to get your head around but once you can do that you'll be much 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 more capable of maintaining those easy runs for longer and you'll be in a place where you can take that same mentality and let's say you're running a half marathon you can take that same attitude, that same principle, um, and that same practice to easing back. Once you know you've pushed, you've pushed that little bit too hard, you can feel the lactate begin to really accumulate in your legs. You say, right, okay, I'm just, before I blow a gasket here, I'm just gonna ease back, get my heart rate back under control, rather than what we always see, which is just that, that steady, steady, steady increase. Okay, so, be good to talk about this. Cardiac drift. Okay, and again, I'd like to see down in the comments, actually, who sees this kind of thing? Okay, who sees that? So this is a, a 20, was this a two-hour run, which worked out at about 20 kilometers. You can see the gradual increase of heart rate here. Now, this is really indicative for me of the fact that, you know, I'm still, as much as I'm, I'm doing these two-hour runs now, I'm still relatively early in this return to running, still only a few months into this. So it's something which I think for me is still quite pronounced. I know that as I get fitter, I'm going to see that I keep it more under control for longer. So I see a gradual reduction of cardiac drift. Now, it will always be there. Okay, as James absolutely says, you always see drift. It's always going to be there to a degree certainly in my experience. But the question is what we can do to help ourselves, what we can do to help ourselves manage cardiac drift. Now, it's one of the big factors actually is hydration. Okay, hydration, if we think about why the heart's having to work harder as we get later into a run, as we get dehydrated, the thickness of our blood Okay, the, the, amount of, the amount of water in our blood is, is slightly, slightly less. So the amount of thickness in our blood is more. And the heart has to work harder to push the blood around your body. So you end up in a position where your heart ends up, for the same effort, creeping, 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 creeping up, 
one of the ways to control that a little bit better is just to begin to make sure that your, hyd your hydration is on point. I used to do most of my long runs with a little bit of water, sometimes no water. I'd just go and do my long runs and be, ah, I'll just have a good old drink when I get back. The biggest difference was made for me when I actually started hydrating properly on my long runs. Um, right, let's have a look um, as we get into the comments again. We've got, okay, Bjorn saying as a 51-year-old man, there are way too many factors in your life that impact your pulse to use as a reliable tool for controlling intensity. You have made the effort to slow down on your runs though. Yeah, Bjorn, give me a second. I pulled you up for a reason. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, so, yeah, let's just get rid of that. There we go. Okay, so, again, learning learning things about your body that will help you not see this cardiac drift. Firstly, hydration. Secondly, not overreaching. Okay, I told you that fitness, you know, fitness-wise, as your fitness improves, as your endurance improves, you're going to see less cardiac drift like this. Flip that on its head and say, okay, actually, is the fact that I'm seeing a pronounced cardiac drift, even more pronounced than this, is that indicative of the fact that perhaps I'm not quite ready for the two hour long run? Perhaps I'm not quite ready for the two and a half hour long run. Perhaps actually it'd be better if I just ease back on things just that little bit and um, just focus on, focus on consistency rather than being a hero with any given specific long run session. They're kind of two of the main things that I'd, I'd really suggest if you, if you do see graphs like this or more, more pronounced. Now, there are a bunch of other factors that can affect your heart rate. And Bjorn mentioned this a second ago, said that look, there are so many things as a 51-year-old guy, blah, 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 it's going, to, um, it's going to cause heart rate to be somewhat unreliable. Yes and no. Okay, so I, I there are so many things. Okay, so yes, sleep, stress, caffeine has been mentioned a ton in the comments. I've kind of not really pulled it up much until now because I want to talk about it here. But you know, skipping, I think I can't remember who said it in the comments a moment ago, but skipping your, your, your coffee, your strong coffee first thing in the morning before you run, that's going to help you because coffee's a stimulant. So skipping that's going to help you keep your heart rate under control. It's going to stop this, um, this uh, synthetic agent working upon your nervous system which would then force your heart rate to increase more than it would do normally as we're running but if we're stressed if we're sleep deprived if we're start slightly under the weather so we're, we're coming down with something these are all going to be factors that can impact what your heart rate is doing even things like hydration no, sorry well i mentioned hydration a second ago i didn't mean hydration i meant humidity and heat they're also going to affect your heart rate so what Bjorn was saying in terms of it, them making heart rate a really inaccurate measure to then use to guide his training, I'd say actually it's more of, once you know your body, it's more of a factor that allows you to get some feedback. Get some feedback on how your body's feeling um, and how you're, how you're then supposed to act. So... If you know, and this is where tracking things like your, your resting heart rate is really important, not just what happens when you ex exercise, but if you know that perhaps your resting heart rate is slightly elevated, or you know that as you get into the warm-up for a run, and you know that the kind of pace you're running at, where you should be, if you see that your heart rate is slightly higher than it should be at that point, then that's a signal to you to say, right, I actually need to ease off here. Okay, I need to dial the pace back, allow my body what it needs, and not try and push this as a really tough session. And tough could mean fast. In this case, we're talking tough meaning long session. Okay, it's important to take that feedback and to, again, focus on what really matters when it comes to heart rate training, which is keeping in the right zone and just discarding pace. So if you're stressed, if you're sleep deprived, and you're used to going out and staying in your, your zone two heart rate, and I'm intentionally not giving heart rate uh, figures here, okay, because we're all going to be different in terms of where our, our zones are, but if you're used to sticking in, a, in your, your zone two um, at a certain pace, but you are sleep deprived, you are stressed, perhaps something's going on at work, etc., etc., that, 
that's where you need to, if you see your heart rate creep up, ease back, give yourself the, um, just, just be a bit easy on yourself. Give yourself the kind of respect to say, right, there's a lot going on outside of running right now. There's a lot going on that's having clearly having an effect on my body. Okay, even when, even if it's not directly related to exercise, it's having an effect on my body because it's pushing my heart rate higher than it normally would be in this warm-up. That's where you can say, right, this session now needs to be perhaps a bit shorter than it would have been. This session perhaps needs to be a little bit easier pace-wise than it would have been. And just take that feedback that your body's really trying to give you. Okay, that's... That's one of the biggest one of the biggest things. Okay, I think a lot of us we get into this place where we know we want to run slow to run faster. We want to do our low heart rate training, but we still got one eye on pace. I'm guilty for it as well, but we we've still got one eye on pace. If instead of having one eye on pace, we can just say, you know what? I don't care what pace I'm running. I'm just going to be guided by what my heart rate says because that's what I'm trying to train. Then that that mindset opens up a whole new world in front of you okay if you can just say right i'm not worried about my pace versus my friend's pace on strava what my my friends and colleagues are going to see of my pace on strava um if you just just decouple yourself away from that all of a sudden that i mean that's why i'm now trained just to time okay I, i don't care how much ground i cover i don't care what pace i'm really running at i'll take a look after the fact but it'll just put you in a much healthier place to be able to say, right, I'm clearly a bit stressed today, going to ease back a little bit, um, and just, even if it feels like I'm running extra slowly, as long as my heart rate's where it needs to be, I'm getting the training effect I'm after. Okay, so sleep, stress, caffeine, heat, humidity, they're your kind of big ones. Definitely, definitely, definitely don't underestimate those. Okay, um, let's have a look. Bjorn, is saying that you do know that many skiers and runners uh, like one Jakob Ingebrigtsen use pulses at all. It does seem to work, but you do really make an effort to keep the pace and effort easier. Yeah, so again, it's uh, you know, <laughs> there's no mystery around this. It is it is a tried and tested thing, but it's um, it's just so, so, so important to take, just take all the, the cues your body's trying to give you. I think that's the easiest way to say it. Now, Let's quickly jump into the comments again and look at um, look at what I've been missing. Here we go. So we've got from Ian, 48 years old, been running to, to pulse years after. Sorry, start again. Been running to pulse years after a few years doing sprint tries. Oh, okay. Now trying out zone two low heart rate training. Been running and walking, and it works. Probably nine and a half to ten minute miling at the moment. You can do a 20 minute 5k. Awesome. So you've got a 20 minute 5k runner. You know, you're used to running at, at that pace. If we're doing a 5k time trial or a, or a sprint try, um, and you're running now at nine and a half, ten 10 minute miles at that easy, easy pace, and you're feeling it works. So my friend, I'm very, very pleased to hear it. Um, let's have a look. Steve says, <laughs> Steve says, am I strange? Your heart rate actually comes down after about 5k. Now, I'd be interested to know whether that's um, what you do in terms of a warm-up. Okay, it might well be that your body's actually, if you're not doing much of a warm-up and you're just heading straight out and running, your body's in this place where it's having to catch up a little bit before it eases back into a, a more kind of um, consistent rhythm. Okay, the, the various different systems in the body, if we just go from zero to running, uh, especially if it's from zero to running at a bit more of a, an intensity, then you'll find that, well, it's why it feels hard. It's why a lot of people talk about those first couple of miles being pretty rough. Um, but actually, if you get a decent warm-up in, then you'll find that you can start off and, and just stay pretty pretty smooth and consistent right from the off. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, any tips from James here? Any tips for someone who's chronically dehydrated, dislikes the taste of water, and has high blood pressure? Um, most hydration drinks have a lot of sodium in them. Good question. Dislikes the taste of water. That's a difficult one. Um, I would... Difficult to answer without having a look at the various different products that are out there and looking at sodium levels, but I think you're on the right path in terms of looking at what options what options might be out there which are low sodium. I know that's a really obvious answer, um, but yeah, disliking the taste of water, that's going to make life quite difficult in terms of staying hydrated if um, if you can't have anything other than water. So 
that's flavoured waters. Maybe that's an option. Um, or squeezing some, squeezing some lemon into your water, squeezing some lime. You know, literally fresh lemon and lime into your water. Give it a little bit of flavour rather than the kind of the branded flavoured flavoured waters. That could be an interesting one. Um, but as someone else who has um, you know, struggles with blood pressure, I I can relate. So yeah, trying to keep it low sodium. That's an interesting one. Hope that helps. Uh, it may it may not. We'll <laughs> we'll see. Um, okay, let's have a look a little further up. We've got the Plant Powered Runner saying, nice to see you running two hours. Well done, James. I very much appreciate that, my friend. Hope life's good with you. Okay, so we've got a comment from Ralph. Any zone two advice for older runners in 50s or 60s? Um, Again, this is this is partially, I guess, specific to those in fifties and sixties, but also just good advice, I think, in general, is to really make sure that you're not just focusing on generic advice when it comes to setting your zones. Okay, you're not just saying, you're not just looking at the kind of the MAF, you know, Phil Maffetone's, um, Phil Maffetone's, I won't even call it an equation, sum, if you like, whatever, in terms of just using your age and dialing back, or even your classic kind of 220 minus age to, to find your max and then work it out from there. I'd go and do some, some specific testing. Um, and that doesn't have to mean lab testing. You know, that could be tests. I've got a video about it on my channel in terms of you know, figuring out your max heart rate. Figure that out um, and then use that to go and figure out your zones rather than just using... Yeah, using using simple equations. I think that's that's your best bet for, for most of us, not just obviously for those in fifties and sixties. I just know that as you get into your fifties and sixties, those more kind of one eighty minus your age or two twenty minus your age, they just get pretty loose and pretty inaccurate. Okay, uh, runner girl says try green tea before a run, less caffeine. I like that. Um, I actually bought some matcha the other day as well. Um, not for this purpose at all, just because I thought I'd try it, and uh, I don't, I don't really know what it does in terms of, in terms of pre-run, but uh, it's uh, an interesting taste, that's for sure. Right, Salim, just general good advice for running uphill, short strides uphill, keep that cadence under control. Again, all these things are going to make it easier for you to not blow a gasket as you're running uphill. Okay, good, good. Right, what else did I want to cover? Let's have a quick look at my notes. Right. I think that pretty much pretty much comes down to or pretty much is what it all boils down to you know i said up front i want to talk about the number one secret to running with a low heart rate and it really is a combination of all those things you know the big secret if there has to be one is decoupling decoupling speed and pace from distance and time okay just focus on time focus on keeping your heart rate in the zone that it needs to be in whether you're running, whether you're walking, swimming, cycling, whatever you're doing, it doesn't really matter. Instead, it's all about just keeping yourself working at the right intensity for the allotted period of time. If you can do that, you're going to see improvement. For me, that is the number one secret for running with a low heart rate. Okay, there's a video which I've linked in the description which talks about the, uh, the hardest or the worst part of running slow to run faster. I'd suggest going to check that out next. I think that for a lot of you will be really interesting. And uh, I look forward to doing more of these in the future. Um, oh, there's a face I, I recognize, Craig Beatty. There's a great Jack Daniels VDOT video on YouTube on easy running. There is. That's a good one to watch. Physiologically, physiologically the adaptations at an easy pace are huge. When it's easy, you're more likely to keep doing it and increase frequency. That's a great place for us to finish. Um, and the other thing that I'll add, because I've said that I talk about it and I forgot to talk about it, was the fact that if you are able to run and hold a back and forth conversation like I'm having now, then you're in the right place in terms of ballpark for your aerobic zone. Okay, get that right. You won't have to be so reliant on the watch. Um, because as soon as you start popping out of the top of your aerobic zone, you're going to find that you're getting into a little bit of oxygen debt, you have to breathe heavier, all those sorts of things. And the, the talking, the rhythm of the talking just goes completely out of the window. Talk test. Coaches standard for a long time. Give that a go. Okay, enough from me. It's uh, lovely to see you all. I'd like to know, either in the comments here or after the fact, over on Instagram, whatever, are these training talks interesting? Are they helpful? Do you want to see more of them? Let me know. All right, I'll see you later. Bye.